All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, Parks and Quality of Life Committee meeting of the Everett City Council for May 17th. Um, we'll be meeting here this afternoon. You can obviously listen. We don't take public comment in these meetings. Um, let's see. And I guess my notes here say you can call in or listen to the meeting. If you didn't know that already, you might not be able to sell this anyway, but you can call 425-616-3920 with the conference ID 724-88726, or on YouTube, if you go to the um, City of Everett website, uh, you can find our videos there. So we're here for Parks and Quality of Life Committee. Um, Council members Liz Vogley, Paula Ryan, Administration Lori um, Cummings, Abby, Abby and Abby Cooley, and Tyler Chisholm. Tyler Chisholm, oh yes, I don't know the name. Thank you, Tyler. <laughs> Uh, so, three items for our agenda here today. Uh, first, summer activities here in Everett. So, Tyler? That's me. Thanks, everybody. This is my first time here. Um, not sure how close to be to the mic. Is this okay? Yeah, Great. Cool. Well, normally I give this presentation via PowerPoint. Um, for this format and to save time, I'm, I've brought a handout that I'll hand out. Uh, momentarily, but um, I just want to go over a few uh, like intents and purposes behind our event strategy and then some context around um, our events permits and how they work working with parks and what uh, what we produce versus what the public produces. Um, first, I'll explain my job and my role at the city. I, my job title is placemaking manager, but that's a program manager position in economic development. And the, man, uh, the programs that I manage are related to arts, tourism, events, as you know, and then I uh, work to support the creative economy generally, mostly through grants and uh, ad, um, uh, technical support, connecting them to uh, resources and things like that. So uh, my intents and purposes today, I wanted to, uh, as I said, share about our economic development strategy with events and then uh, provide context uh, around events and our permitting process. And then I will share a calendar of upcoming events and then answer any questions. So strategies and why do we focus so much energy on special events? First and foremost, economic development. Tourism brings in spending. A couple quick bullet points here. Tourism is the fourth largest industry in Washington. You all probably know that, but for those who maybe are watching um, on YouTube, I think that's an interesting um, detail. Tourism is 21, brings in $21 billion annually to Washington businesses. Uh, it generates $1.8 billion annually in taxes. Um, through surveys and economic data, uh, day trippers spend an average of $50 when they're here for an event. Uh, that's $50 at our local businesses. And then if somebody stays overnight, they spend $121 a day. Uh, that doesn't include lodging. And that $121 uh, data point is from the 2019 Dean Runyon report. That's for Washington uh, Tourism Association. Um, so that is a pre-COVID uh, data point, but we have seen tourism bounce back pretty well um, these last couple of years. So, Continuing on with strategy and why events, uh, events attract critical mass to support businesses. They activate public spaces with legal activities. They allow us to show off our beautiful downtown. I don't know how many times I hear people who come to an event say, I had no idea ever it was so beautiful. Like it's a great way to uh, build rapport with new folks, especially those who haven't gotten off I-5, who just think Everett is a old mill town or something like that, you know. So we love events as a way to attract folks to um, see what we have to offer in our amenities. Uh, speaking of amenities, events are a great way um, to provide amenities for residents and they stimulate social connections. Events, if done well, they create positive experiences. They provide opportunities for folks to recreate and build connections with neighbors. I, as an Everett resident, a resident I really appreciate uh, events both now that I kind of manage and work with them, but you know, it was a way that I met a lot of people when I first moved to Everett. Why do we have so many events downtown? I get asked that question a lot. And so I like to remind people that our downtown is everyone's downtown. I know you all don't need to hear that, but uh, you know, 
Downtown is large. We have ample parking. It has uh, easy transit access for people to come and go. It is ADA compliant, so it's a great event uh, venue um, because of the ADA compliance. Uh, we have a lot of options for detouring traffic compared to other cities in Snohomish County or really in the region. Our downtown, the way that it's set up with arterials kind of surrounding it, make it really easy for us to divert traffic. Gives us a lot of options for event placement and different types of events. Excuse so me. like this weekend with the um, Fisherman's, Fisherman's Village. Fisherman's Village on Wetmore. Oh, sorry. So that's like with the Fisherman's Village this weekend on Wetmore where you could close that down for a exactly street, that whole block. Yeah, that Wetmore block between Hewitt and Pacific is a really um, common event closure that we have. It doesn't impact many businesses mm. and the businesses that uh, are impacted really like. And then we're going to be events. adding a public restroom on that site as well. So yes, sir. make it more inviting. Good. Yep, and that public restroom um, will also, and you know this, but we'll have storage for the farmer's market, mm -hmm. who's a kind of an anchor tenant there with, during our event season, you could say. Um, I'll also say that downtown works because, because it's beautiful, clean, and inviting, and uh, that is because we have so many partners uh, helping with that, uh, police, public works, downtown Everett Association. Um, I'd like to provide a little context on event permitting. I get asked that question a lot, and some of the council members have asked about how our event permitting works. I'd like to just first say that we've worked hard to make our event permitting process simple and really competitive. Uh, we hear all the time that we have the easiest event permitting process in the region, and um, we get to reap the economic benefits of events because of that. Most of the events uh, that happen in Everett, and when I uh, share the calendar here with you, most of them are produced by private parties. If they happen in a city right-of-way, we issue a special events permit through our clerk's office. If they happen in a city park, our parks department has their own permitting process for that. If they happen on private property, generally the city is not involved in any kind of permitting process for that unless it, they, it requires a fire permit. So sometimes you'll have businesses in your district that will reach out and say, hey, we want to have an event in our parking lot. Um, most of the time they won't need any kind of permit on private property, but it's always good for them to look um, to the fire marshal's office for guidance. Generally, if it has rides or large tents or something like that, they'll need a permit from the fire marshal's office, but they won't need a city special event permit. Um, if the city produces the event, like 4th of July, uh, fireworks, and sort of culture, we permit that through a traffic use permit, through our transit, um, or through our um, streets department. And then um, event organizers, when they pull a special event permit, they get, a f they get um, great service from the city. We provide them coaching and assistance as part of their permit fee. We provide a traffic control plan and advising from our traffic engineer. That's a huge value. I'd like to say that um, most cities don't provide that. And if you work with like a vendor that does street closures and traffic engineering, that can be up to like a $1,500 cost. Luckily, our, we've had so many events over the years, we just kind of have them off the shelf that the traffic engineer can pull, make small modifications and send it to them. And that also gives us, um, you know, we can sleep at night knowing that it's done the way that our traffic engineer would like it. Um, they also get use of the city right of way, obviously, with their event permit. And uh, just a note, special events must rent their own infrastructure items, like road closure devices, restrooms, trash, etc. The city does not provide that. We do provide that when it's a neighborhood block party, though. Mm -hmm. um, let me be more specific there. We provide the road closure uh, materials. Permit fees are 310 $310 for a large special event, $124 for a small special event. Uh, a large special event is anything over 100 people. A small special event is anything under 100 people. And then there's no cost for free speech permits or neighborhood block parties. What if it's exactly 100 people? That's a real head scratcher. Sorry. You know, we've never, <laughs> never had that occur, but when it does, I'm sure we'll have to... Uh, there will be a discussion. <laughs> there will, yeah. It'll probably be mostly whatever you predict it to be, and then if it varies a little bit from that. Yeah, my guess is we'd put them in a large special event. Um, it was a joke. Assuming. Yeah, yeah, of course. People will ask. 
Um, okay, well that is enough of my rambling uh, in providing context. Any questions before we go into the schedule? Yeah, for the uh, permits, about how long does it take to process the permits? It's, that's a great question and there's so many variables, so it's hard to answer it. Um, the, it can take two weeks to four months and it depends on where they're at in the process. So some event organizers will submit a permit application without having a, you know, formalized plan. They're submitted to sort of get in the queue and put some holds on some dates. Then we have to go and I'll give them a tour. We'll talk about different options. Um, a lot of times a delay is, uh, if there is a delay or it takes a while to issue a permit, it's because of insurance. Um, it can be tricky to, for an event organizer to get the necessary insurance we require, but our risk manager um, in legal is great at working with event organizers to resolve that. So is there a recommended, um, be sure to apply X number of days or weeks in advance for events? Yeah, for a large special event, it's 90 days. For a small special event, it's 60 days. And then for a neighborhood block party, it's 30 days. Great. Um, great. I'll be sure to pass along to neighborhoods, for, especially for the neighborhood night out coming up. Yeah, great. And Thanks. just a reminder, the yeah, the neighborhood block parties, uh, traffic engineering will deliver the barricades at no cost for that. We do that to support uh, neighborhood events. If there's a, com if uh, we have had times where businesses have tried to pull a neighborhood block party permit, there is a gray area there. If it's for a commercial interest, I do think it's probably best that we put them in a um, special event permit. Um, if it's the intents and purposes or the intent of a neighborhood block party is for a neighborhood to organize it or a neighbor on a block to organize it for social connection and resources and things like that. Great. Okay, I'm going to hand out some uh, some calendars for y'all. Here's everything we have going up, and I'll share this with you. Great. Thank you. Get one to Lori as well. There you go. So this, I'll close on this, and we'll just go go over this. Yeah, sorry about that. I would go. Um, here is our upcoming events, uh, summer 2023. So these are special events. Uh, these are uh, city-led events. They're events down at the port, and this is kind of um, uh, everything that's through the end of August. So right now we have the Everett Farmer's Market just opened up last weekend, a beautiful day for it. They had a record day. I just spoke with Gary today. They had the biggest mm. opening day that they've ever had, and this is their 30th year. Uh, that one brings in about 72,000 people over the course of the market. Um, if you look at that $50, and then you'll notice in this uh, farthest column here, you know, this is a potential economic impact at uh, $50 a day, you know, has potential to generate over three and a half million dollars in spending. We love the farmer's market. Fisherman's Village is this weekend. That's a large uh, music festival. Uh, they do have a free stage. Um, in the every municipal building parking lot. Most of the event is paid uh, ticketed though. That one draws about 10,000 people. We, uh, we estimate the economic impact to be about half a million. Uh, this is a fun new project that we're working on with the Everett Station District Alliance on May 27th. Um, and with Urban Artworks, we'll be painting four murals down in the Station District, including the underpass of the Pacific Avenue Bridge that comes down um, into transit. And we're working with four local artists on that. This may be, this may be the first official event of the Everett Station District Alliance. I wonder. I don't know that it is their first official event. Um, I, I don't they know. They were formed a couple of months ago, so it might be. But okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. They've uh, they've done some neighborhood cleanups and things like that. Mm -hmm. But um, one other thing I'll note, just get out of order a bit here. But if you look at, uh, well, I'll stay in order because we've only got one here. But cruising to Colby, that's Memorial Day weekend. That's probably our largest single event. That's the classic car show that's been happening for a number of years. That one draws in about 30,000 people over the weekend. Um, it's shoulder to shoulder downtown. This next one, the Summer Lawn at Everett Station, is a really cool event that the Station District is um, putting on. And it's, it's an event, but it's also a plaza. They're setting up a pop-up parklet that'll be set up on 32nd between Payne and Smith. They're bringing in a lot of uh, 
like uh, they're bringing in our official turf and tables and chairs. The Wednesday farmers market will be in there. Um, so the Wednesday farmers market is coming back. You'll notice that on the list as well. Um, and then the station district has a lot of other fun programming stuff um, teed up for that. And that one is kicks off May 27th uh, with the mural day. And then that will go through September 15th. And the station district um, is working on getting their communications out about all the different programming. Then we have Artist Garage Sale, which is the Shacks event. That's uh, June 3rd, downtown Hoyt, um, between Hewitt and Pacific. That one brings in about 8,000. Danger Busters is a fun event from the Imagine Children's Museum that teaches about uh, emergency preparedness. That's June 4th, right outside of the Children's Museum. Then the Wednesday Farmer's Market, as I mentioned, will be part of the Station District Alliance uh, Summer Lawn. Sorta Culture, the city's uh, garden arts festival, that is one that my team produces. That's the second weekend in June. Uh, we moved that event downtown, uh, as you all know, um, during the pandemic uh, 2021 to meet the capacity requirements set by the state. We decided to keep it downtown because um, it works really well downtown. It's ADA compliant, it supports businesses, and it's easier for people to spend money um, because they don't have to take a shuttle to it so they can buy more art and support the artists. Then, uh, this is exciting, we have a downtown Pride event this year, June 17th. That one is gonna be at Wetmore Plaza, California and Wetmore. Then, the Went and Mayor's Arts Awards, that's another city produced event. That's June 23rd at Everett Performing Arts Center. The next one, the Everett Performance Omnium, is a brand new event for us. I'm still working with the event organizer on finalizing their route, but that is a bike race. Um, if any of you ever have seen the Ballard Criterion, the bike race that runs through Ballard, it's an urban road bike race. Um, they're planning one downtown and one in the Northwest neighborhood around Grand Avenue Park. And I'm working with that event organizer right now on like door-to-door -door outreach to get public comment on that. So, so not like the Fremont bicyclists? Unfortunately. Okay. No. That's a different grade. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, I'm really excited actually about this bike race because those types of sporting events draw um, quite a bit of overnight stays. They're the type of event that people like travel up and down the West Coast. It's their hobby, it's their lifestyle. And so those kind of niche sporting events are actually really great for overnight stays. Is that true for like the um, cycle cross that's happened a couple of times at Thornton Sullivan? Is that also some overnight stays? Yeah, you'd have to ask Parks on that one. I don't work with that oh, group, yeah, but, I, but I believe it's the same. Um, those niche sports, those subcultures, mm -hmm. uh, they travel to compete in their sports. So I assume the cycle cross folks are similar to this group. And is Apex Racing, is that a, 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 a business, a team, an organization? A, yeah, it's all of that, club? actually. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. You know, uh, the cool thing about Apex Racing, um, he is a local gentleman who just lives in the Riverside neighborhood. His name's mm. Ryan Spivey. So he's got the community uh, at heart. He's thrilled to be bringing this event from Seattle up to Everett. Great. And then we have the 4th of July. Um, the fourth, the city produces the fireworks and the festival at Legion. You all know that. Um, the Fourth of July parade is returning through a special events permit. Uh, the Fourth of July Foundation is producing that. The city is ensuring that public safety, sanitation, and uh, transportation are managed. Um, other than that, it's fully led by the 4th of July Foundation. I'd just like to thank that group of volunteers for bringing that back. Next, we have Music at the Marina, uh, another event that was uh, led by the city that now is privately organized um, by Everett Music Initiative and Lombardi's. That starts July 13th and goes through August 31st. That's Thursday nights at Port Gardner Landing. Then the Everett Three on Three Tournament that was a new event for us last year. The founder of Hoopfest in Spokane um, is the one who brought that to us. Uh, that's July 15th and 16th, that's downtown. Uh, I would visit their website for complete closure information. It's a pretty big closure, but most of it occurs on Colby. Then Salty Sea Days, the downtown Everett has revived uh, the Salty Sea Days name and it's their summer block party. That's July 21st and 22nd, and that's gonna be on Wetmore, and they're gonna utilize the Everett Municipal Building parking lot. 
Sale and Cinema Returns, that's a port event. That happens at Boxcar Park. It's Fridays, July 21st through August 25th. The Nubian Jam, which is the Snohomish County Black Heritage Committee. This one um, is through our parks permitting, uh, and it happens at Forest Park. It's July 29th. And then we have the Upper Left Beer Festival and uh, the Everett Food Truck Festival. That's August 11th and 12th. That's on Wetmore between Hewitt and Pacific. And then we have, uh, we finish out the season with uh, Shaq's Festival of Artists Working. Uh, Fresh Paint, that's August 19th and 20th, and that's in front of the shack this year on Hoyt between Hewitt and Pacific. And that one moved up from the port. Uh, it was historically held at the port, and moved, they moved it to downtown, and they're gonna continue it in downtown. All right, that's uh, what we have planned. Any questions, comments? It's nice to see these, kind of, nice to see these things happening. Yeah. Going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'd like to call attention to the anticipated attendance that we think these uh, events can generate. About 256,000 folks coming into town or um, participating in these events, and then that has the potential to generate over 12 million dollars in spending for our local economy. Uh, I'm really excited about that, and I'll say that if you want to get connected with any of these event organizers, just shoot me an email. Great. Sure. I have Thank a you. quick question. Um, so, uh, can you share more about how the city also supports these events, like through LTAC dollars or um, other, I mean, you mentioned the like road closures and just helping with the logistics and stuff, but there's, what are some other ways that the city's helping to support the organizers? Specific to our, the ones that are privately organized and permitted through our special events permitting mm -hmm. process? Yeah, so I would say first and foremost, uh, staff supports with um, coaching, advising, helping them source, helping them with um, outreach when necessary, um, connecting them with sponsors if they ask to be connected with potential sponsors. So that is just what we consider customer service and account management. Um, it's kind of in that uh, more of a sales and customer service um, lane. But then we, um, we, we, sorry, my. Uh, I'll help you, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Fisherman's Village, I believe, got a grant from. Oh, LTAC, that's why my brain, because I knew that you had asked me another question. Thanks, yeah. So LTAC funding, that's a lodging tax advisory committee. A lot of these events do receive LTAC funding. That's out of my world. Um, that is managed by another person at the, at the city. Uh, Simone Tarver is managing that now. Um, I do connect them with grant resources. Um, so I'll make sure everyone knows when LTAC applications are open, including uh, county LTAC and then county TPA as well. So I, my role in that kind of account management role will help advise them on grants that they can apply for. What's TPA stand for? Yeah, great question. Tourism uh, promotional area, and, and I'm, uh, I sit on the TPA board as of this year. So advocating for Everett events on the TPA board. That does bring up a question also in terms of interacting with the county and events they might want to be holding. Is there a, an interaction that way? Is there something we should know or do? Um, we meet with the county regularly with the tourism promotion folks through the TPA, but then also with their, um, with their tourism arm, Seattle North Country, mm -hmm. and we do discuss um, events that we're trying to recruit and support and empower. The TPA fund is really, um, what I would say, the TPA is different than LTAC because the TPA fund has historically been used to recruit larger events like uh, larger sporting events and mm -hmm. Tough Mudder and thing like that, mm -hmm. things like that. So TPA is a, is a really strong economic development tool. And then are there any events that you know of being held like on the county campus or anything like that that's organized separately? Yeah, if an event, like we have um, some events that will want to start on the county campus, we'll connect them with the county campus, help them get those permits, and then when they move on to city property. So we coordinate in that way. Okay. 
Great. I have another question, seemingly random. Um, let's see if I can articulate this. So looking through the list of events, there's some uh, infrastructure things that are duplicative, like stages or um, flags or um, like other, I don't know, maybe booths and tents and stuff. Um, would it make sense for the city to purchase any of those things and then they could rent them from us or that we could have them to provide to our own city-sponsored events or what would what does that cost benefit analysis look like for my on the spot question? Yeah, yeah. Um, I worry that some of that might be gift of public funds um, if we were, unless we had some sort of sponsorship or, you know, and there was consideration exchange for that sponsorship, like a stage rental. We do own a small stage, our parks department owns a small stage, and so the community events have been able to use that when it happens in a park like a Wetmore Plaza and things like that. Uh, we do provide event organizers with the list of vendors. Uh, we don't put our name behind any vendor, of course, like as a city, but I can say here, you know, these are the vendors that I've worked with over the years that have supported other events well, and they can shop for cost and, and things like that. But no, I don't, we've never, I've never considered purchasing any of that infrastructure stuff and um, trying to loan that. Uh, trying to rent that, excuse me, to an event. So. Just curious, thanks. Thank you. All right. All right, thank you. Summarize that very well, thanks, Tom. Oh, actually, sorry, I do have one more question. Um, what are some ways that um, we can help with promoting the events or getting the word out, or how can we support your work? Yeah, great question. Is your meeting with constituents in your district, just remind them, I would say direct them to visit Everett. We have an events page on there that lists everything that's um, happening in town through our special, that it's a large special event. Um, and then there's a really robust events calendar there for other community events. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of these event organizers are, are um, looking to raise funds, you know? Um, events aren't, I would say a lot of the a lot of the events that happen are community-minded folks, like the Fourth of July Foundation, Cruz and Nicole. you know, they're not doing it to become rich; they're doing it to provide an amenity to the community. And so, particularly the ones that are led by nonprofits like the Shack and the Fourth of July Foundation and Cruz and Nicole, um, fundraising is how you could how you could help them. And what was the site you said it was Visit Everett? Yeah, visiteverett.com. Tyler, in some cases, volunteer um, offers volunteerism as well. Yeah, especially Fourth of, Fourth of July parade. That's a great comment. Thank you so much, Lori. Speaking of volunteering, um, so if you like get a speeding ticket or something and you need to do volunteer hours, this happened to me a long time ago. Does the city say, yeah, we'll sign that off with volunteer stuff? You That's, probably don't know, but I have no it's, idea. Yeah, it's a thought. It's an interesting. Uh, yeah, I actually need to work off one of my speeding tickets. I'm just kidding, that's a joke. I haven't got a speeding <laughs> ticket since I was 19. But uh, yeah, the 4th of July Foundation, if you do know of uh, community groups that are looking for volunteer hours, particularly um, um, schools and like younger uh, folks who don't mind getting their hands dirty and lugging around trash in the morning and things like that, they're looking to fill those types of volunteer roles right now. So thank you, Lori. I'm still hoping to bring back the Salty Sea Days Parade. So if you hear of any, well, anything for that, let me know. I'm sure, uh, you know, I haven't heard from Downtown Everett Association if they, if they are planning on bringing back a parade. Um, yeah, they, but, there were some very well-loved things because uh, Silver Lake used to have the triathlon mm -hmm. and there were hundreds of people involved in that. Um, and so that's, there are things that were, and that did help connect a little bit because Everett is so far, so long, 15 miles, I think, from north to south. So there is a tendency sometimes, especially in the neighborhoods that I represent, they're almost as close to Northgate as they are mm -hmm. to North Everett. And so it's easy to get drawn away a little bit. So that's probably more on me and you to some degree to tell our neighborhoods to get involved. Yeah, it's a great point you bring up. I will say that my, um, 
super, my boss, Julie Willie, has asked me to explore how we can help more events occur in South Everett. Uh, one thing you could do to help is if you know of any um, folks with a great idea, like let's say that you know fol folks that want to bring something to life, like Hugo from El Mariachi Berea had reached out about a, like a taco fest in South Everett, like yes. perfect example, right? Like, okay, he's got great food and he's got the connections, but he just kind of needs a little bit of help with know-how and how to raise funds. It's a great way that we can kind of step in and I'd say that's a big part of our strategy is how do we, um, how do we convene? How do we be a catalyst for those types of things? The city's not the key dominant producer of events, but we're the, we're the um, catalyst for events. There's another perfect example that is just barely pre-pandemic. We had thoughts about it and then it got shut down because the pandemic was a, uh, a paddleboard regatta on Silver Lake because we're seeing a lot more of those oh, yeah. there. It's fairly accessible, lots of people doing it. There's parking, there's access in different areas and it seems like a neat idea but hasn't been yet pursued. Yeah, anybody has a fun idea like that and they just need some support, connect them with me and we'll see how we can help them bring their vision so to life. So is that T. Chisholm at EverettWa.gov? Thank you very much. Mm. Yeah, T. Chisholm at EverettWa.gov. It could be cool. the Festival of Everett Tacos or FET. <laughs> I, I guess that was my easiest Festival one. of Everett Tacos. Of Festival of Everett. Just don't put dog at the end of <laughs> That's the joke I was reaching for. I'm glad you went for it. Yeah, yeah, nice. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, then next on our agenda, library summer events. And I think, Abby, that's you. Yep, that's me. Thank you for having me. Uh, so this is a timely topic. We are uh, youth services and adult services uh, coordinators of this program actually just presented the same information to our board last night. Uh, so Liz, sorry, it's a little bit repeat from what that's you heard last night. <laughs> Um, but we are gear we do summer reading every year, and this year is no different. Um, and just kind of a reminder of why summer reading programs are important for our community members um, is that uh, you know it's pretty well known that there is reading loss over the summer um, as kind of the summer slide for reading. Uh, and so encouraging reading, encouraging engaging with the library helps uh, prevent that summer reading loss. Um, it's also really advantageous for students who just generally struggle with reading to have that continued uh, interaction with reading throughout the summer. It's a little bit, uh, you know, reading not assigned to schoolwork. It can be, uh, can help uh, struggling readers engage with it. Uh, our library staff kind of individually tailor reading options uh, for struggling readers and also provide alternate formats for books, right? It's, it's not just about reading the book, it's listening to the book. Um, with, uh, you know, reading comprehension can also happen through, through listening. Um, and then it's also a really great opportunity for the students to get that self-selection. Um, so instead of being assigned a reading book, a, a, mm. a student can come into the library and pick the, the book that, that uh, speaks to them. Uh, and their parents can uh, work with the, the children as well to identify books and topics that are important for the children to read and that they're interested in reading. Um, so our summer reading, we have three kind of, three programs we're doing, we have two programs for for youth and one program for adult. Um, I'll just, we actually have these ready, so I'll just pass them out. The, this kind of purple and orange are our two youth ones. These are actually the reading logs. You're welcome to take one if you'd like. Um, the theme this year is Find Your Voice, um, and it's, you know, Find Your Voice for can be very broad and it, it can be find your voice for music, find your voice for writing, find your voice for building things. Um, and students will use these logs, um, or children will use these logs. We're using a bingo format this year. Um, so for the kids, eat, they can, for each hour that they read, they can mark off a bingo square. Um, there's also other challenging activities challenges. So you can, um, you know, it might be reading aloud, it might be attending a library program, picking a book that's by your favorite author, um, that's also just engaging the students, or the, and I keep on saying students, but children. Um, complete five squares, and it doesn't actually have to be in that bingo line like a more traditional bingo is, uh, and you get uh, a free book, and you also get uh, an OL, OL Rain ticket. Uh, they've uh, 
the books are provided through our friends of the library, and OL at Rain is sponsoring a ticket. Um, and then That's for basketball. if you complete, I think it's actually soccer. Oh. The storm is women's basketball, right? So as an OL rain, rain, I think women's soccer. I actually have no idea. I, I was just putting it out know. there. Go sports. Tyler, Tyler might know. <laughs> I'm terrible when it comes to sports. <laughs> No, but I, but I think it's a great idea, actually, because you're, you're you're broadening the net of things that will bring people in, that will yep. motivate them. And I know from raising one anyway that sometimes getting someone sort of over the hump into something where they get some sense of competence and something's a little easier, then they get the vision to pursue it. Before yep. that, it always looks a little like a job or a task mm -hmm. or something like that. So if you catch them... Um, if it's curling, yeah. I don't care. It's always <laughs> great to get a reading. And then there's additional prizes you can win. So for every, you know, if you complete 10 squares, 15 squares, 20 squares, um, we, for, the, for the kids, there'll be a treasure chest they can select from with the color-changing pencil, the kind of erasers and fun shapes. Uh, and then there's also uh, these kind of on the edge for each kind of five that they enter. They get, a, they get an entry to our grand prize drawing. Uh, we have six bikes to give away. Um, and then we have, and that's uh, sponsored by the Masons. And then uh, we also have a Lenovo tablet to give away as well. And uh, the kids will get to choose which grand prize. Uh, and so if they want to put all of their entries in for a bike, they can do that. If they want to spread it out, they can do that. Um, and uh, the tablet is also uh, sponsored by the Friends of the Library. OL Rain is a professional women's soccer team in Seattle. No. <laughs> um, and then to go along with this, we have lots of engaging summer reading activities. Um, we, we have programming all year long in the summer. is just when uh, kids are out of school, it's a prime time for us to offer programming for youth. Uh, so we continue to have story times throughout the summer, including this summer we'll have a bilingual story time, a Mandarin English story time. Uh, we have a rock and gem program. We have a henna arts program. Uh, we have a Lego engineering series. Uh, magic of ladybugs and butterflies, and some other gardening kind of programs, uh, beginner ukulele, um, and uh, embellished lettering, which is led by a, a local artist. Um, so again, trying to offer a wide variety of programs that can engage uh, individuals with different interests, but also expose people to, to uh, different activities they may not uh, have a chance to be exposed to elsewhere. All of our programs are free uh, to participate in and to attend. I see you're doing both the Evergreen and the main, Evergreen branch and the main library. So yeah, we have programs do. across both branches, yep. Mm -hmm. um, and so the kind of transitioning, uh, and, and I will say too, that the youth one is for all ages, so even infants who aren't quite reading yet, uh, if there's activities for, the, for, you know, to be read to, uh, even just having, uh, you know, if, if you have an infant, uh, there's great value in the infant just being read to, seeing someone turn pages, hearing, hearing the language. Um, so it's encouraged for, for everybody. Um, this year we are uh, reintroducing our adult summer reading program as well. So we are truly offering it to all ages. Um, and uh, there, just like youth, there's many reasons why a summer reading program is value, valuable beyond just being fun. Um, it's, uh, you know, Adults who have children that are doing the summer reading program, it can set a really good example for youth. Um, you know, parents and caregivers uh, can kind of read along and participate along with, with their, their kids and show that reading is enjoyable and, and what you gain from that. Um, engaging our adult readers is also good for the library. Um, you know, it, it showcase the, the bingo card helps showcase all of the services that we have and it and helps introduce people to services that they may not be aware that the library has for them. Um, and uh, you know, it can showcase our, beyond just our books, our research databases, uh, our eBooks, our science kits, our Discover Passes, all the other, other items that we have. Um, and then of course, the more people we can engage with the library, the more support we have in, um, for the use of the library and for advocacy for the library. Um, and then obviously, right, reading at all ages, boosts our knowledge, uh, exposes us to new ideas and new thoughts and, and different cultures and different uh, beliefs. 
Uh, it can really help alleviate stress and kind of promote self-care. Uh, you can do, uh, reading is shown to increase empathy to others. Um, it can strengthen our creativity, um, and it just generally stimulates our brain, which is especially good uh, as you age. Uh, and then just, again, it's the bingo format. Uh, the complete the five cards, adults also get a book, and they also get an OL Rain ticket. Um, and then the, uh, the grand prize drawing is for uh, the, the tablet as well. Again, uh, sponsored by the Friends of the Library. And just like we do for youth, we have lots of uh, events for adults and for all ages. Uh, we have book discussion groups coming up. Uh, we have those all year round on different uh, subjects at both locations. Uh, we're having a drawing program. Uh, we have a birding in Everett program coming up and we'll actually be having uh, birding uh, kits that can be checked out so you can go experience bird watching in our own community. Uh, we have a DIY, DIY green cleaning product program. Uh, we'll have a, some music programs, concerts coming up. Uh, we're having an event at Scuttlebuck, a, book, a books and brews event, uh, and uh, beginner ukulele, uh, just a wide, again, a wide variety of programming, um, in addition to some of the programs we offer regularly that'll also be happening over the summer. So we do Narcan training, we do that kind of once every few months, so we'll have, one of, uh, we'll have that coming up. Uh, we also have a series where we, uh, with our lawyers in the library program, uh, where we have a free legal clinic, um, and we are doing, uh, with sh uh, sharing wheels, uh, we have a, a bike clinic that's been happening as well. Um, all of our events can be found online uh, on epls.org. Um, and uh, you can also find more about our summer reading program as well. And that is kind of summer reading and summer activities at the library in a very quick nutshell. I'm complimenting you on doing a lot for a fairly lean staff, and I think you had commented about library hours and staffing and working to try to improve that, so. Yeah, th uh, so thank you for the overview. Um, I was always, I was the previous liaison for the library board and was always impressed with just the amount of work that you guys are doing in addition to the number of books and materials that are circulated each month. And um, so, uh, in addition to hearing about the summer reading program and exciting stuff coming up this summer, I was hoping you could also share uh, more about um, the current library hours, and I know that it's short on uh, Sundays, and then also uh, as council members, what can we keep in mind and ways that we can uh, possibly restore library hours back to uh, their full full capacity? Yes, yeah, so uh, we have, uh, experienced a, a pretty drastic reduce in staff, especially when you go back all the way to 2018 is when you kind of start to see our uh, decrease in uh, staffing levels. Uh, we have, do have tremendous staff that have a lot of passion and, uh, and just love for, for what they do as librarians and just for the community in general and are very dedicated. Um, and we can uh, continue to do programs like this and it's a, a priority for what we do. Um, we're also really lucky that we have a lot of uh, support from the community for sponsors to help cover the costs too, right? So, our, so the, the prizes are all sponsored. Uh, the vast majority of all of our programming is from donated funds through mm -hmm. endowments that we have for the library. Um, so those are big pieces why we can continue to, to support the programming. Our current hours right now, we are closed both locations uh, on Sunday and our Evergreen branch is closed on Mondays uh, and then we're open uh, at the main library on Mondays from 10 to 6, and then both locations are open uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays from 10 to 8, and then Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday uh, from 10 to 6. Uh, we, coming out of the pandemic, we really pushed ourselves to try to expand hours and to provide that seven day of service, and it just became pretty clear that that was not sustainable for our staff. Uh, it, uh, we, we weren't, out, it, it just, uh, the schedules we were providing the staff were just not uh, supportive of them and, and allowing them to, uh, to succeed and not burn out. And there were times we would have to, you know, we were getting to the point where we were, gonna, we were closing random days because we didn't have enough staff to be able to open. So it just wasn't sustainable. And 
I think it, it, it pained everyone, our staff, to have to pull back because we, our, our core wants to provide those services. Um, so kind of what it would take to return to seven days a week service at both locations, so that would be reopening Evergreen Branch um, on Mondays and then opening both libraries on Sundays uh, for a shortened day for four hours. Uh, we would need an additional uh, 3.9 FTE, um, pr predominantly in our circulation side. Uh, so we'd be looking at one FTE for a circulation assistant three, uh, 0.5 FTE for a circulation assistant two, 1.2 FTE for a circulation assistant one, uh, and then a library associate at 1.2 FTE. Um, very rough estimates for kind of cost of those salaries based on 2023 20, Salary mm -hmm. figures, not knowing who's in it, you know, so it's, I say it's very rough, uh, is about $293,000 is what the, the kind of dollar amount, uh, including salary and benefits. Okay. And do you have the ROI numbers? <laughs> so Return on investment? Yep. Can you calculate um, that for that kind of thing? Yeah, and it's awesome. Listen up. I should have it. I hope I if have not, it. If not, I took a picture of it of the slide last night. But it's like two yeah. point seven or something to so, one. So yeah, so we did a, a calculation. If you take kind of all, it doesn't cover all of the services we have, but considering a lot of our services. So if you say we checked out six hundred and thirty thousand books, um, if the average value of every book that you buy is fifteen dollars, right? If if so 638,000 checkouts were turned into purchases. Um, and then even if you account for, okay, well, I can sell that book back, right? So then, so kind of formulating that, uh, considering that, uh, you know, if you were, if you needed access to the internet and a computer to use the internet and to print something uh, and you had to go to, uh, and I don't honestly even know other places in Everett where you can go rent an hour, but like if you were gonna go to Staples and say it was gonna be $5 an hour to rent, you know, to get an hour of computer time. Uh, if you consider an average program that you're gonna go, if you're gonna go to a performing arts event, like a, a concert that we have, you're gonna pay $25 for that. Um, and so you kind of multiply that by the statistics that we're seeing. So this is based on our 2022 uh, statistics that we had. Um, our total library spending uh, was just about $4.9 million. Uh, calculating all that, the value that we're bringing to our community is just over $11 million, which translates into a direct benefit to spending ratio of 2.27. So essentially every dollar that you put into the library, the, the community is getting $2.27. So we, not, as a department, we don't produce a lot of uh, revenue um, from sales or anything or anything like that or from permits, but uh, the value we bring is what we're contributing to the community. Can you repeat those numbers for us, please? Yeah, so for, for every uh, $1 put into the library, the community is uh, receiving $2.27. So are you value. saying that for every dollar <laughs> that we put into the library, we're getting back $2.27? Yes, I, well, I would argue it's probably even more than that because you know, our calculation doesn't include things like the, you know, we have the, the legal clinics that we're partnering yes. with and the value of what our community members are getting from having free legal services, of having connections to a social worker. Um, so uh, having someone help fill out uh, job applications and receiving a job, right? So that we can't really calculate. That, that, those things aren't even included in this. It's kind of amazing. Okay, it's more than kind of amazing. Highlights the importance. Highlights the importance of us working out our funding for the city and doing the best we can. Well, um, thank you, Abby. Yeah, um, of course. We actually, in our agenda here, we have several possible future agenda items, and I know there have been a couple of emails about future meetings, and I think, didn't one of them, I think one came from you, if I remember right, what we're trying to figure out. I think it was Parks, a briefing with Bob. Do you remember? I send a lot of emails. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I receive a lot of emails. <laughs> um, oh. Yeah, I think uh, one of the agenda items that I've 
want to prioritize was one that we had prioritized in our retreat about ways that we can fill vacancies downtown and incentives and carrots and sticks and plans and whatnot. So um, I see on the list here that it looks like it's tentative for July 19th, which feels a long ways away. So I'm hopeful that um, that can get, mm -hmm. that can either be solidified or moved sooner, so. And maybe there's something coming from the Downtown Urban Association survey that will mm. help guide that. And that really kind of links into economic development as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, something else I wanted to add. Oh, good, Lori's back. That's right. Um, so we were uh, talking about future agenda items. And um, do you happen to know if the, the tentative date of July 19th for vacant storefronts, if that's you know moving what? more towards definitely or maybe? Do you know this? The July 19th date may be the result of a comment that I made to the mayor uh, about my capacity to help with that project, um, saying that I would be available to work on that project after July 4th, um, and also waiting for the Downtown Everett Association survey results, because that'll inform a lot of that work. We've done some preliminary work already, uh, meeting with the outside council we have for ARPA. Um, that I've worked with through the Everett Ford grant program, which has been my uh, role in um, kind of art <coughs> distributions to the community. Um, we've done some preliminary legwork on figuring out how we would uh, potentially deliver a program for vacant storefronts, and ARPA may be one, as somebody said, carrot. Um, mm. So July 19th, I believe that I or Dan Ernesty will be ready to provide a program overview of how this may this may look. Hopefully that provides some context for that date. Thanks, yeah, I think, um, and then there were, we had also brought up about um, strategically thinking about how certain uh, zoning requirements downtown are inhibiting vacant storefronts from being filled uh, like Sandra's closet had a tough time finding a spot because certain blocks are zoned uh, to not allow for like pawn shops and junk stores. Um, so diff some of those restrictions, like where are those and how can those be lifted to reduce barriers for people um, moving in downtown? I'd like to see um, the uh, medical facility one removed because I think that's um, that ship has sailed and be great to get it'd be great to go to my chiropractor downtown and easily and whatnot. Um, I don't actually go to a chiropractor, but, um, and then, but I think that that it also includes, uh, I'm not sure if that it would include input from our planning commission or if it would just be from Yorick to give an overview of block by block, what's zoned, what's not, you know, what can and should be lifted. Um, and also for the, I can't, I wish there was something besides carrot and stick. I've been hearing that so much lately, I'm so tired of it. Um, but for the stick part of it, um, maybe there could be penalties in place for uh, folks that are purposefully keeping spaces vacant or not making a, doing their due diligence and earnestly trying to fill vacant storefronts. So the city's missing out on revenue that could be generated by businesses in that space and we're not. So, you know, how can we um, encourage doors to be open literally. Um, go ahead. I think we can kind of add a holistic presentation around that at the July meeting, I'll confirm staff availability, mm -hmm. but, uh, but last I heard that was the date that made more, we were more, more able to accommodate than the June date. Great, yeah, so, so I, I guess I'm using that as a, uh, to illustrate it's more than just the ARPA considerations, but there's, you know, like the holistic view and- Yeah, understood, plan, bigger yeah, plan. and I was gonna clarify uh, after hearing what you said that, yeah, my role in it would be around um, the possible use of ARPA as an economic development tool to stimulate some of that, but that would be, that would be where I would be involved, but the other things are Dan and York. Yeah, not till 6.30 though, you're early. Mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, go ahead if you have more on that topic. Ben. 
Oh, uh, no, only that uh, realizing that, you know, now that we're doing these once a month at a faster pace than we've done these kinds of meetings in the past. So I think we're Hooray. we're working to um, match up administration's responses and our concerns and all this sort of stuff and get the get the pace right. Um, and I'm not sure then if that points us to anything specific for a June meeting, although we could start that kind of discussion about what are the factors and what kinds of things we'd like to know or what we can go find out about that might be a suitable item for June. Sure. Then would um, sorry, may oh, I? Yes. Go. Just looking at the climate action plan implementation update, it seems like that may be I don't know, I can't speak for staff, but it seems like they might know something about that already and can come in in June and who knows because I don't. We can follow up on that with email then between now and then and the three of us. And, sure. and another suggestion for uh, future agenda items, I've seen the list so I know it exists, um, a parks update on uh, when new park uh, facilities and yeah. playgrounds are going to be coming in because I know that they have a, fan, a very large spreadsheet of um, just the capital improvement projects uh, for our parks. So I think it's helpful for the public to know when their neighborhood playground's gonna be updated. That's true, and there's an effort to try to bring more equity to what we have in the different parts of the city. And the city has a fair number of parks, but not always the staff or resources to, to uh, keep those where we'd like them to be. Or oh, I have one, maybe just the signs because this is parks and quality of life and public works does I don't know the signs and down in in South Everett I know that um, I've spoken with um, public works and like Corey and everybody and at their low staff and their 300 pound signs and it's been a couple of years they have them in storage but there's just not enough can person you power clarify which signs you're talking about Everett Mall way the street signs that are heavy and up on enter tall that are um, terribly faded ah okay that might be for there might be public safety or built environment committee yeah I'm putting it out there because I don't know I'd like to see in my quality of life <laughs> um, the signage for Everett Mall Way and Evergreen Way and all the other streets mm -hmm. that have 300 pound signs. Yeah. Yeah, well, we can circulate those things in email between now and June and make plans for June. And I think we're coming to our, to our end time. Nobody has anything else to bring up at this meeting that I think we're set. All right. Thank you all. The end of our May 17th Parks and Quality of Life City Council Committee. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.